glad you're here with us. Uh, and uh, why don't we open with a word of prayer, and then we will get right into our uh, class for this morning. Okay, let's pray. Lord, bless and be with us as we continue and begin our conclusion, Lord, of God and the pandemic and N.T. Wright's very thought-provoking take on what we're dealing with right now in this world. We appreciate it, Lord. On this World Communion Sunday, we're also reminded, Lord, that this is a global event. Sometimes, Lord, our vision gets narrow. We get tunnel vision and look at our community only or our neighborhood or our nation only, but it is a global event. So help us remind us of that, Lord, as we share communion with Christians all over the world this day. Thank you for being with us. Give us joyful worship and keep us all safe and in your peace. In your holy name, we pray. Amen. Okay, let me get, oh, I get, let me let a couple people in. All right, and all righty, okay. So let me get right away to the uh, <clears throat> screen I was wanted to share with you this morning. Just want to be sure we were recording before I got there. <laughs> and uh, here we go, all right. Okay, so we started last week, just as a recap, and we're running through the five questions. Why must we lament? How do we talk about God? How do we live in the present? And how do we recover? And I'm going to pick up right now on how do we talk about God, uh, which is on page 55. I don't think we got that far last week, or if we did, we're just going to redo a little bit of it again. Okay? Okay. Uh, so, um, uh, everybody with me? Everybody okay? All right. Uh, let me stretch this out a little bit so I can kind of see everybody. And if you have a comment or Anything you want to say anytime, you're welcome to do so as always. Uh, there we go. Move this up a little bit. Try to get it. Didn't, uh, Mac, we didn't get to the T.S. Eliot poem. I don't know whether you care about that one. Well, we let's do the T.S. Eliot poem, okay. uh, poem. That's fine with me. Um, let me uh, jump to that real quick because I have that. Uh, give me just a second to uh, get this off and go back to... Uh, uh, okay. Ah, man. It's so weird. Why is my screen sharing pause? All right. Let's, uh, pardon me while I try to find, okay, there we go. File. What page? Uh, here we go. Uh, it's coming. A uh, guy. Oh, that, that's on page, uh, hmm. 54. Open up. Open up. Where are you? Both have opened up. Uh, okay, okay, that's it. All right, uh, it's on page out, uh, 54. Um, so let's look at the introduction to this, kind of coming in. Um, on the bottom of page 53, it says, our culture is afraid because it seems to be afraid of the fear itself, frightened that even to name grief will be to collapse forever. And last week I asked the question, how did our culture get this way? How did it become kind of so delicate, to be afraid of the fear itself. And then he talks about our groanings are too deep for words. Um, uh, and then he quotes this T.S. Eliot poem. And I'd love somebody to read it if they would. Okay, I will. Okay. I said to my soul, be still and let the dark come upon you, which shall be the darkness of God. I said to my soul, be still and wait without hope, for hope would be hope for the wrong thing. Wait without love, for love would be love of the wrong thing. There is yet faith, but the faith and the hope and the love are all in the waiting. Wait without thought, for you are not ready for thought. So the darkness shall be light and the stillness the dancing. In order to arrive at what you do not know, you must go by a way which is the way of ignorance. Okay, so as you look at that poem, and T.S. Eliot's always so good at, always at expressing these kind of ideas, what, what images strike you? And what do you think T.S. Eliot's talking about here? What do you think T.S. Eliot's talking about here? Yeah, we don't really know what's going on. <laughs> okay. Okay. But what's the meaning of that for T.S. Eliot? Right. But what's the meaning of that for T.S. Eliot? You need faith. Uh, 
he noticed the line, but the faith and the love and the hope are all in the waiting. And I think what he's saying here, and we can, you know, look at this and apply it to the pandemic, written in a time when these things were quite common, um, is that that what he focuses on is just the, the waiting itself. He doesn't, you know, he says faith, love, and hope are all in the waiting. Uh, wait without thought, for you are not ready for thought. What is he saying in you are not ready for thought? I'm never good at this. <laughs> What's that? I'm never good at this. Oh, I, no, well. I, I know in high school, it's like, what did the author mean? It's like, I don't know. I didn't write it. <laughs> T.S. Eliot's particularly I got, hard. I got a C in poetry in uh, college. <laughs> <laughs> well, since I, since I studied T.S. Eliot, uh, being an English major, as well as a religious He's a major, person. Yeah. Uh, you are not ready for thought. There are times when you, you know, thinking about something doesn't answer the question for us. It doesn't give us what we need. That God is a God of darkness at times. Um, uh, and that if we, we let the dark come upon us, that, that, that when we reach for hope or faith or love, when we reach for those things, to, to find them in the midst of, of the mystery of God, that we're not going to get an answer, that, that God will reveal. Uh, and I like this line at the bottom. You must go by a way which is the way of ignorance. You must go through times when there are no answers. You must go through those times. Uh, it is a way. Ignorance is a way. We're not used to that, thinking that way. But, but the fact is that we don't, you know, there are things we just don't have answers to. And wh while, we can, while we can say we know why, it's, we know it's a virus, we know how it spreads, we, you know, we can't yet give it a perspective. Or, or what we're really trying to answer, what, his, what Wright is trying to say, why is God doing this? And we don't have an answer for that. We really don't have an answer for that because we shouldn't even be asking the question. That's what T.S. Eliot is saying. Don't ask the question, why? Can everybody see it, the screen, by the way? <coughs> Can everybody see the screen? Okay. Um, um, you know, you can't even ask the question, why is God doing this? There's no question to be asked. And that's what N.T. Wright would say. Would anybody like to respond to that? Oh, it, it seems to me that T.S. Eliot is giving us bad advice here, just to be <laughs> controversial, is that no matter how bad it is, or no matter how dark it is, we should all have faith, hope, love, intelligence. If, if the only point is that sometimes you can't know the answer, then okay, fine. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't have faith or hope or love. And, I, and I'm not sure that's exactly what he's saying. I think when he puts these categories out, um, let's say he does this. Love, let, let me go down and say what, what N.T. Wright says at the bottom of 54. A time for not rushing to judgment. Let me re go back. There is a time for restraint, for fasting, for a sense of exile, of not belonging, of defamiliarization, a time for not rushing to judgments. It's all too easy to grasp at quick fix solutions in prayer as in life. And he points out that T.S. Eliot wrote this when the skies over London were dark with German warplanes. Um, uh, Eliot had realized that all the easy comforts for which we reach when things are tough are likely to be delusions. Um, and so I don't think T.S. Eliot would say that faith, in fact, I think in bringing up faith, hope, and love, he's pointing to what we as Christians know, you know, what we believe about Christ. I don't think he's saying don't have it, but I think what he's saying is it's not to be dogmatized into a a religious answer. Uh, I see that. What's that? 
I see that where he says, but the faith and the hope and the love are all in the waiting. He's not saying not to have it. Right. He's saying not grasp at straws, <laughs> not jump to conclusions. Um, yeah, and I, which, is what I, which is what N.T. Wright is saying, you know. Right, and I, and I think it's a lot harder to do that these days with also all the social media and stuff, um, and, you, you know, with the bombardment of opinions and uh, thoughts. But, but I think he's saying have it, but wait. Uh, don't grasp it, Scott. And I like the line before the last one. In order to... Not- Go ahead, go ahead. The word I key, key in there is the word wait. I would yeah. joke with my students, my least favorite word, or my favorite four-letter word is the word wait. Very right? good, very good, and, yes. Um, yeah. Oftentimes, you know, as teachers, we say, well, you need to have, you ask a question and you have wait time. So mm-hmm. you wait for the students to think about what's going on. Right. But then right. in television, in a lot of our everyday conversations, that silence is deadly. And yes. that's also waiting. Yes. And it's hard for us to sit and wait for whatever it is, whether it's a, a response to a question or the message that we're getting today. It's just that wait. Ah. <laughs> what, do we, what do they call silence on television when it's technical or silence on the radio when it's technical? It's, it's called dead, dead, dead air. <laughs> <It's> dead <laughs> air. <laughs> As if silence was dead, you know. Mm-hmm. So, so if we, and that's the culture, that's how we're acculturated, that there can be no dead air. So I love what he says, like I said, at this last, right before the last line, in order to arrive at what you do not know, in order to arrive at what you do not know. Think about T.S. Eliot's situation historically. They're being bombed. I mean, it's obviously the blitz, right? And people are trying to come out with all kinds of ways to stop this. And what are some of the ways, what is probably the most destructive way that they're saying to stop this blitz? Bomb back. What's that? Bomb back. Not bomb back. Bomb back was fine. That's the war. In fact, just the opposite of that, which was what? Going into the uh, shelters. No, surrender. No, surrender. 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 Yeah, surrender. Remember, that's the kind, if you watch the movie about uh, Winston Churchill, he was under tremendous pressure to surrender. And, and you know, up until the point that they finally said, no, we're not going to do that. But, but there was tremendous pressure just to give in. And and reach a compromise, which, you know, he knew there's no compromise. And that's, to me, that's the very meaning of arriving at what you do not know. Arriving at what you do not know. So how are people arriving at what they do not know with with COVID-19, with the pandemic? Does anybody see an arriving at what you do not know? Every day. (laughs) What, What do you see? Oh, uh, I mean, there's just, there's so much talk and, and, and really at this point, because we're in an election politicizing uh, the virus that uh, in, in ways that just make no sense, it's clear that the virus takes the, the most powerful of us and the weakest of us. And, and none of us would have predicted that, although some of us would have thought that perhaps a maskless president was not a good idea. Um, but it's it's finding its way and it's showing. So no matter what you what punditry you're going to try to provide today, it's going to be it's going to be uh, not relevant tomorrow. The the bottom line with COVID nineteen is what do we do do not know yet about COVID nineteen? Lots. What, uh, yeah, what is the de- what is the number one thing we don't know? How to cure it? How to stop it? Right. We know how to slow it down, but we don't know how to stop it. And when we say cure, I'm talking about that in my meditation today. No, no, because curing is still not curing with this stuff. No. Because there are post-COVID effects, and we're going to talk about that. Right. And so all we think of right now, as I hear it in the culture and all over the world, actually, are the terms 
something. It started, we need to stop. Start and stop. Um, sick and well. But that's not how this is working. So, so I think that, that we arrive at what we do not know when we, when we focus away from the true reality of the devastation of having a pandemic with a virus that we just don't really understand yet. We're getting better, but we really don't understand it. Yeah. Jack, yeah. Can we really blame God for this pandemic? Or should we blame God we, when we know that this was a man made virus uh, and somehow or other was transmitted all across the world? Is if this we, God's yeah? Is this God's way, or is this man's uh, either stupidity or you know or it, never mind? But well, I mean, obviously, the answer to that is the answer, correct answer in every disaster. I mean, if you build your house on the on the beach and a hurricane comes, your house is going to get destroyed. Are you going to say God destroyed my house? No, you built your house on a beach. You know, right. I mean, I mean, what I'm saying is the world turns. There are viruses. There are natural disasters. These are things that are in the world. Blaming God is, is not going to give you a good answer, is it? No. I mean, the only no. way to blame God, to hold God accountable People that don't believe in God are not going to blame God. They may, as Vin T. Wright points out, they mm -hmm. may use the virus to say, see, there is no God. I mean, how could God, in other words, how could a good God allow this to happen? That would be their question. And since God allows this to happen, God is not good. Therefore, there is no God. Okay. Or God is bad, one or the other. But, but the point is that, that you know, the only the only way, thing that you can say about God in the pandemic is, well, you know, God sent this for us to repent, and this is what N.T. Wright's talking about, or God, this is a sign of the end of the world, you know, and of course we've been over and over how N.T. Wright just clobbers that, I mean, he just he just clobbers that all over the place, um, and um, um. So, you know, I mean, what do we do about that, you know? But, well, I, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I thought that um, the thinking of, I mean, in terms of cause, is that the intersection of uh, people and wild animals is um, not a healthy thing. <laughs> I mean, yeah. the people eating yeah. wild well, animals and... In, in maybe in not a careful way, um, she's what has caused several of these recent, like Ebola and um, SARS and so forth. That's what I understand. And I think that's a really good answer, Betty Lou, because when you can point to a human reason of why <laughs> this happened, that pretty much takes it out of God's hands. You know what I mean? I mean, I mean, I'm sure... God would probably prefer that we don't eat wild animals or that we don't, that we take more precautions since we gave us brains to figure that out, right? I mean, God give, did, did give us minds. I mean, when we talk about being created in the image of God, it's the ability to think, right? Well, you know, we sometimes don't think. But, but blaming God is just a way to not think. Blaming God is just a way to me to say, well, you know, it's not my fault. It's not our fault. Um, or, or to say, I have an agenda with God. I have an agenda with God. And it's like the people that are trying to force the return of Jesus by, you know, by rebuilding the temple in Jerusalem. You know, we're going to force Jesus' hand. You know, that kind of thing. That's not really thinking I don't think. I mean, it's a way of thinking. I don't. I don't think it's going to work. What I'm saying. But I wonder if uh, if N.T. Wright isn't saying that that's our fate as Christians to wait. We're not going to know what God is up to. 
and we are just going to have to live with it. He says in Christ, not only do you know everything God is up to, you knew everything God was up to when he rose from the dead. And N.T. Wright, I think, would say that was pretty much what God was up to and has been since then, establishing the kingdom of God. And that pretty much everything else, God doesn't micromanage in the sense of God did what God needed to do for the salvation of humanity. And that was a pretty big deal if you think about it, you know, because up until that happened, God was a, even the gods or God was projected as someone who like kicked you when you fell down or gave you money when you hit the lottery, you know, that kind of thing. That's how God was thought of, you know, whereas N.T. Wright says in the resurrection of Christ, that all goes away. You've seen everything that God is going to do. There's a finality to that. So the waiting, but it's not a waiting of just sitting around like this, he'd say. We continue to bring the kingdom of God into the world. That doesn't stop. That started with the resurrection and, and the, that started with Pentecost, and it's been going ever since. The age of the spirit. Okay, let's move on to 55 now. Um, how do we talk? How do we talk about God? Um, let's look down at the bottom of page um, 55. Well, at that last paragraph. Uh, he talks about Jesus' rescuing humanity. Kind of the ultimate Passover. That Jesus' was the ultimate and final Passover. And then he goes down. In doing this and believing this, Jesus was thoroughly in tune with the vocation of human beings in Genesis to reflect God's purposes in the world. When humans sinned, God didn't cancel that part of the creational package. He called a human family knowing full well that they were as flawed as the rest to be his partners in the work of redemption and new creation. And then he points out that Jesus wept at the tomb of his friend, agonized in Gethsemane, cried out on the cross and was abandoned and that it is in this way that God's kingdom was established. That this way, and it's important for him to say that. On page 56, we'll flip over, um, in the middle of that paragraph, or down toward the end of the first paragraph, that's what the Western powers have done again and again at the political level. It's what some apologists try to do on the intellectual level. God is sovereign. He can do what he likes. Therefore, whatever happens must be what God wanted. So we must be able to say why. In other words, the answer to why is God is sovereign. But then he moves us over to Genesis 6.6. 6, and I have that. Um, let me get over to it. Uh, Genesis 6.6. 6. All right. Uh, right, where are you, Genesis 6, 6? Is that it? Uh, yeah, here we go. Okay. Uh, anybody want to read? The word is Nephilim, in case you're looking at it. Anybody want to read it? Save my voice. Save my voice. Okay, I'll, I'll read it. Okay. So start at the beginning there? Yeah, when people When people began. began to multiply on the face of the ground, and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that they were fair, and they took wives for themselves of all that they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in mortals forever, for they are flesh. Their days shall be 120 years. Wow. The Nephilim were, Nephilim. On, the, yeah, Nephilim. Nephilim, thank you, were on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God went into the daughters of humans, who bore children to them. These were the heroes that were of old, warriors of renown. Keep going. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. What, going to the next paragraph on page 56, this is what 
N.T. Wright focuses on. In Genesis 6, 6, God sees the wickedness of humans, and he doesn't say, well, I have allowed that in order to do something with it. It grieved him to his heart. The Hebrew text is explicit on that point. And it clearly, he said, troubled Jewish, Jewish thinkers because it, in the Septuagint, the, the um, uh, uh, Greek translation of the Old Testament, it said, and he thought it over. Doesn't say, and it grieved him to his heart. It said it thought him over. Why is it more comfortable to say, about God, he thought it over, than to say it grieved him to his heart. Because they did make that change. It's not nearly as bad to say, yeah, well, you know, let's think about this for a while. Then, oh my gosh, what have I done? You know? Yeah, I, 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 let's even, yeah, that's good. That's good. Go deeper. Let's, let's go deeper into that. Well, it would mean that God was in charge still if he thought it over. Good, good, good. What does it say about God? Now, remember, these were the Jewish rabbis. Jesus had not come <laughs> when this was written, okay? The Septuagint had not been written. I mean, the Septuagint was already around. So why was it difficult for them to acknowledge God grieving in God's heart? Because they didn't see him as a compassionate God, I don't think. All right. I, 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 Take it a little further than that, because compassion is one aspect of that, but even take it broader than that. Take it broader than just compassion. What made them uncomfortable? Make them look weak if he cares about something. Very good. Weak. It, it gives God a human, human um, image that God yeah. could create. If God has emotions, what does that mean? What does that have to do with the God of law? Oh. If God has emotions. What does that have to do with the God of law? A lawyer. Contrary to it. <laughs> it's contrary to it. Exactly. Yeah, in some ways, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's contrary to it because law is yes or no. Right. And emotions are, what am I going to do? You know, this is horrible. This is terrible. And mercy, and 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 it's it's a more merciful thing to grieve uh, than to have a law that just tells you what to do. And N.T. Wright would ask us, why we Christ? Why is it for we Christians easy to see God saying He was grieved to the heart? How would N.T. Wright answer? How would N.T. Wright answer that? Why is it easy for Christians to see God as grieved to the heart? Because he, he gave up his son. More than just giving us his son, go further than that. Go when on God down. So page. Loved, when God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Look at the son. Look at the son. Look down on page 56. Yet there is a, down at the bottom of the paragraph, yet there is a straight line from what Genesis 6.6 6 says about God to what Mark 14.33 says about Jesus. My soul is disturbed within me right to the point of death. Do we see Jesus emoting? Yes. Yes. I mean, when do we see Jesus emoting? Think about your Sunday school stuff. When do we see Jesus emoting? Well, he wept uh, when he saw um, that uh, the, the brother was dead. Good, 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 good. Yes, yes, very good. That's an example. Let's broaden that out. He had compassion. What else do we see in Jesus? Oh, when he got mad in the temple. All right, anger, anger. Mm -hmm. What else do we see? Think of Jesus' emotions. What else do we see? What do you see in the Garden of Gethsemane? Fear. Say it again. Say that again. Fear. Some fear. Fear. Of, of what fear. is it? And depression. Mm -hmm. you, cry, you cry tears. You sweat. You sweat like tears as big as blood. That's fear. That's anxiety. 
It's emotion. I mean, yeah, facing the cross, how are you supposed to feel? Right? Right? So when we, it's so easy to create the image of a heroic Jesus, to turn him into Hercules, which is actually what the pagan world kind of wanted to do. Turn him into Apollo, to a heroic Roman mythological figure. But the whole point of Christ going to the cross was it was not a heroic act. It was an act of love. It was an act of, of, of pouring himself out for the point of salvation. Now, we may put that into heroic terms. I guess we can. But it, not heroic as Hercules. Not as heroic as Hercules. Um, uh, when we look at that. So, so the point he's making is that we, you know, we can certainly live with a God who not only has emotions, but feels great emotions, despair, and sometimes even is at a loss. At a loss for what to do. Uh, look, at, look at the next page, top of page 57. Yeah, go ahead. Before we go, uh, Mac, I, I don't want to show my ignorance, but I will. I, I always do. <laughs> Nephilim. Yeah. Can you explain who the Nephilim were? Well, these are, there are stories that come from what we call the prehistory. Because the history of Israel really begins with the call of Abraham. That's where it starts. But there were, that came later. And a lot of these were actually written that, not, that's not to say they weren't made up, because those stories were passed along orally, but they were actually written down, usually like during the exile, because, you know, you ha you know, why are we being punished this way? Well, we did a lot of bad stuff in the past, you know. The story of the Nephilim, actually, you might recall, Jim, from our study on Revelation, is a... A, 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 a revelation picks up on the story of the Nephilim. And it is kind of a, a, a pickup on some of the pagan myths of, of the time that it was written or that it was passed along. Um, uh, because there are pagan myths about the gods coming to earth and bearing children. And that they became a threat to Zeus. Okay, this kind of picks up on that. Now, I'm not so saying I'm not saying the Bible that, yeah. is actually um, influenced. Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I mean, parts of it, parts of it. You know, the prehistory uh, is oral tradition passed down, but when we get to a story like the Nephilim, biblical scholars will argue that this came from much later and is an interpolation. If you want to go into biblical study, an interpolation in that particular part of Genesis. Uh, remember, there are two creation stories representing two different uh, oral traditions, the Deuteronomic tradition and the priestly tradition. So, so the prehistory can get a little bit on the on the need to delve into it side. Um, um, and this is what happens with the flood. This is leading up to the flood, right? And the point of this is an explanation for why did God destroy everything on the earth? And, and, and so that's the explanation. But it actually picks up on some common pagan mythologies. No, I'm really glad that I asked you that because I I never would yeah do that. I mean you could go into all kind of rationalizations of who the Nephilim are today, which is really kind of dumb because it misses the point. Of, it misses the point. conspiracy theory about space alien. Yeah, well, yeah just, just perfect, perfect. Thanks, John, for clearing that up. John and 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 John knows his space alien. Let me. I know he does. I'm not, and, sure, we're not sure he's not one. Oh, well, I know. <laughs> but John knows his space alien. And, 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 and right, there are people that point, and John is exactly right. This was an alien event. Really. But the Nephilim were aliens that came down, you know, and so forth. So, you know, I mean, 
and that's like a modern, if you want to call it modern interpretation of that particular text, part of the text. But there's also an ancient interpretation of that text. And we got to think about what tradition it came from, what oral tradition, prehistory, you got to be really careful with. You got to be really careful with. And it's very interesting. Oh, it's very interesting. Agreed. But trying to set it into the, the narrative of a straight narrative from creation to whenever is very difficult to do. It's really hard. And don't struggle with that because, uh, because no, no, I'm not saying you are. I'm just saying to anyone, don't, we're not to struggle with that because it, it's good to understand the history of it. It's great. I'm sorry I pulled you away from No, that. no, no, no. Where we were going. It's a good question. It's great to understand the history never... of that. Because I always argue every story has a point. If we miss the point, and a lot of times we do because we want to keep it within the context of a, some theological point of view, like fundamentalism or inerrancy, you know. If we miss the point, what good is the story? And, and, um, uh, and I didn't really understand this story until I studied Revelation. That's when I understood it. Ah, that's where this came from. And as some would argue that the stories came from this. Maybe so. That the pagan stories came from this. Who knows? But we know there are all kind of flood stories out there. Right, John? There's all kind of, there's all kind of flood stories out there. I mean, something happened. But there are tons of flood stories in cultures all over the place. So something happened, right? Okay. So let's move on then. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's fine. Please stop. There are no, there are no, there are no bad diversions. It's always good to be learning these things. And I want you to have understanding of them. So don't dare worry about asking that kind of question. It's good. Um, look on page 57. Second paragraph. Everybody with me? Equally, some things apparently shock God. The Israelites were told again and again that they should not practice human sacrifice. However, they didn't simply do it on the sly. They constructed great high places for this specific purpose. God's response is to say, I didn't command this, nor did it come into my mind. And he points out the Hebrew text says heart. Um, I don't think we have to read Jeremiah 731. I do have it, but, but, Here's God again going, what are you doing? That, there's no reason. I have no reason for you to do this. You know, and remember, Jeremiah is what? What is Jeremiah? I mean, who prophet. was Jeremiah? Who was Jeremiah? He's a prophet. He was a prophet. The prophets don't speak in the same terms as the priest and the, the others do. They speak in these terms of an emotional God. I mean, they were always doing emotional stuff to, to give the message of what God was thinking. So they would do incredibly stuff, some just weird, to, do the, to, to, to express what God was thinking about Israel. And, and so the prophets kind of were the precursor. When we talk about Jesus in the prophetic role, that's what we're talking about, revealing the depth of God's feeling in ways that we can understand, okay? Go to the next um, paragraph on that page 57. This is, of course, a paradox. We see it most sharply when Peter says to the crowd that the death of Jesus was what God had intended and planned, but that the people who arrested, tried, and killed him were wicked to do so. There is no way around this paradox, nor should we look for one. In other words, this is the thing that you hear this not just about <clears throat> this. You hear about Judas all the time. Wasn't Judas doing God's will? Wasn't Judas doing God's will? And if you look at what N.T. Wright says here, do we have an answer for that? No. So would Judas be condemned? Was it wrong what Judas did? Yes. That's what N.T. Wright's saying. You can't justify an action under the rubric of it's God's will that it happened. 
believe me, if Judas hadn't done it, somebody else would have. If you look at the setup to Jesus' betrayal, we see G Jesus doing everything he possibly can to keep him from doing that. He knew Judas was the weak link in the chain. I mean, they were all kind of weak links, but he knew particularly Judas was. And he did everything to stop him. Put him in the seat of honor at the Lord's Supper. Put him at the, right beside him at the seat of honor. Did everything to say, don't do this. Then finally said, well, if you're going to do it, go do it. Do it quickly. You know? So, so we have to be really careful about assigning the bad things people do as God's will or God's purpose. I don't think it was God's purpose that Hitler killed six million Jews. Although there are people that will actually say that out of the context of the Jews needed to be punished because they rejected Jesus. Have you ever heard anyone say that or seen that written before? It's out there. Martin Luther said that. What's that? Martin Luther said that. Oh, yeah, Martin Luther, because Martin Luther was horribly anti-Semitic. You bet he was. I mean, he was. And, you know, I mean, it's embarrassing, but... Calvin said some fun things too. Um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's good to put that into the context of that. But Martin Luther was a human being, as is Calvin, as is us, and we're really stupid. So, you know, we don't say we don't say bright things, do we? We don't do bright things either. But you think the things that Jesus was saying publicly, you know, going in tearing you know, trashing the things in the temple and saying that the priests were not, you know, doing the right thing. I mean, he was, you could see that he was doing things that was, were going to cause him to be killed. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The environment was, they just needed a spark and Judas provided the spark. But what Jesus was doing was in his role as the Messiah, because the expectation of the Messiah was that the Messiah would do things like this. In fact, in John, when Jesus overturns the tables in the temple, the only question that's asked of Jesus is, by what authority do you do this? They don't condemn him for doing it. They ask, what makes you the Messiah? Because only the Messiah would do this. So you see, the, the, we have to look at it into the context of which Jesus did it. He was living out the messianic expectation. Which was to challenge. Which was to, you know, to, to point out the hypocrisy. To point out the wrong. The problem is, they just couldn't accept him in that role. They just couldn't do it. But do you think they expected the Messiah to come and take every, trash everything off the Absolutely. Temple? Absolutely. You bet they did. Go read, the old, go read the Old Testament. It's all over the place. Yeah. The Messiah, the prophets especially, the Messiah is going to set things right. The Messiah is going to upend. And the new, you know, we will get back to the true religion, the true spirit. That but was do, prophetic. Do you think the priests expected that? Well, I mean, like I said, we, we, we certainly in John, we see that. Uh, we see, um, um, you know, we see in John, like I said, they don't react with anger. They just act, react with what gives you the authority to do this, which could be said in anger, but, but, in other words, Jesus, you know, what, again, we need to be really careful here, Bailu, because, you know, we, you know, the, the, the conspiracy to kill Jesus was on the head of the conspirators, not on Jesus. They did not, in fact, they were the keepers of Israel's religion to conspire to murder someone 
was the worst thing they could do. That was a total violation of every Jewish law, including the kangaroo court that got him to the cross. They did everything totally against the law in what they did to Jesus. Totally against the law. With the help of the Romans, though. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, well, you, in the fact, if, yeah. Were, yeah. Go ahead. No, but I'm just saying that, you know, I, I know about Judea law, and this was a terrible thing that what was happening, but the Romans were orchestrating this uh, because they wanted to get rid of this guy. Uh, you know, it, it, he was a problem to them. But, but so I don't think they knew how, that, how bad it was going to go. Well, I'm glad you brought this up because if you look on page 58, N.T. Wright directly addresses this. Good point. I'm glad you brought this up. Um, and he does so using John 19, 11. Look on that paragraph at the, the second paragraph, actually kind of the first paragraph, but it's at the bottom on page 58. It is altogether more appropriate then to recognize that God has in fact delegated the running of many aspects of his world to human beings. In doing so, he has run the risk that they will grieve him to his heart or shock him out of his mind. But when this happens, he will hold people responsible. That is the other side of the coin of his delegation of authority to his image bearers. Now, this is N.T. Wright. After all, Jesus recognizes that Pontius Pilate has a genuine God-delegated authority over him. He merely comments that God will therefore hold to account those responsible for handing him over. Let's look at that text. Um, let me find it. Here we go. I think oh. that's it. I hope that's it. Let's see if it comes in. Should. All right. There we go. Okay. Um, Somebody read that. It's not long. Now, when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, you would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him. But the Jews cried out, to release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. Now, this is a very controversial passage in John that has been argued over by biblical scholars and theologians for centuries, okay? Because what most scholars say about this is that John wrote it in the time when Rome, when they were trying to pacify Rome, the Christians were trying to pacify Rome. Therefore, they took the blame off of Pilate and put it onto the conspirators who turned Jesus over. There was, a, in other words, scholars will say, some scholars, not all, say there's a historical reason for that. But what N.T. Wright is saying here is something a little bit different from that. He's saying, look, Pilate had the authority, and all authority comes from God. Pilate had the authority, but that the blame, he says, Pilate would have never even had to make this decision had they not brought Jesus to him. Right. Right. So the blame belongs to the ones that brought Jesus to him. Now, as Doug would well point out, Martin Luther immediately said, well, see, the Jews killed Jesus. But, but which Jews killed Jesus? Was the problem was that they were Jews? Or was the problem was that they were blinded by their own authority and power and their own orthodoxy into seeing that Jesus really was the Messiah. So, you know, to jump to any anti-Semitic person can jump to the conclusion that the Jews killed Jesus. But if you look deeper in the story, they were just bad. 
And if you know the laws of Israel at that time, they were really bad. The, the high priest, they were really bad because they violated every, you didn't, how many, how many rabbis went to the cross? Has any rabbi ever gone to the cross? Did they in history? No. How many Jews went to the cross? Not many. And, and, and because there were legal, there were laws. There was process. There was court. There was decision making. But they had to get Jesus killed. They, they violated every law, every law of their own in doing that. And that is how they deserve condemnation for that act. Absolutely. So, you know, I mean, that's kind of how N.T. Wright, and probably more how Reformed theology looks at that. It's not an excuse for anti-Semitism, nor is it to say, well, if it was God's will that the high priest conspire against him and turn him over, then... You know, uh, they were doing the right thing. Legally, they weren't. Furthermore, they could have stopped at any time. Somebody could have said, hey, how about a little due process here? They tried. Right? Yeah. Well, you could see Nebuchadnezzar. They, you they could see. A try with Barabbas. You could see. You can see mm -hmm. several of the elders really struggling with this. Um, um, uh, Joseph of Arimathea, um, um, it slips on mind. Who did Jesus, who came at night to Jesus to talk to him? Remember that story? You must be born again. You must be born again. Who was that that he told that to? It just slipped my mind. Nick, was it Nicodemus? Nicodemus, Nicodemus. I wasn't even going to say that. Good. Nicodemus <laughs> really struggled to keep this from happening. But even he got overwhelmed by the whole thing. Couldn't stop it. Shows you that conspiracies, and I, if you know, you know this, if you've ever been a victim of conspiracy or seen conflict caused by conspiracy, it gets its own momentum. And people who you never thought would go along with it will. So it's a very human thing. And believe me, they weren't doing God's will by doing that. I mean, that's what, especially what N.T. Wright would say. They're still accountable. So, so again, N.T. Wright's not trying to weaken God. He's just simply saying, if we're created in the image of God and God has given us choices, the, given us choices, that means we make choices, moral choices, good and bad. And we are held accountable for those choices as we should be. Right? I mean, it's only a crazy person that says, <clears throat> well, God told me to shoot that person and kill him. You, you see this all the time. God told me to murder that person. It still happens today. God told me to murder that person. And we go, huh? Those persons wind up in a mental institution. You know? So, yeah. Anyway, uh, let's move on then. We're gonna, actually, we're going to have to stop because we're getting close. Um, the next question will be next week. We'll start with, how do we live in the present? Okay? On page 59. And my intent is to finish next week. With those, yeah, with those, looking at it with those final two questions. How do we live in the present and how do we recover? So next week will be the last class. Okay. I'm only at 77%. What's that? <laughs> Says it's only 77% through the book. Yeah, I know. That's our stuff at the end. We're going to have to get that 20, 23% in really good. <laughs> can't we? Yeah. All right, let's have a word of prayer and then we'll be um, on our way. Lord, we thank you for bringing us here and for these these deep, deep things for us to learn and understand. And sometimes, Lord, not to understand, but just to wait, as T.S. Eliot said, to wait. So grant us peace and waiting. 
as we are in this very strange time. Be with all of those, Lord, who, are, who have been affected by this virus. Those who are sick with it, the families, and those, Lord, whose lives have changed radically from it. Help us, Lord, as the church to do what we need to do to respond as the people of the kingdom of God. All this we pray in your holy and wonderful name, now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. See you in worship. Let me stop the recording. Stop. All right. Thank you. All right.